This video is an outreach at Unity Christian Church, 5255, South London Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Updated Version, and commentary is from Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by Jordan. Our subject today is the cost of discipleship. Our scripture reading is from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. It reads, Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So, therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Faithful discipleship is definitely not for the faint of heart. Jesus uses strong language to spell out the high cost of discipleship. It must be total dedication that moves from wish to careful deliberation and decision. It could not be done on impulse. Jesus knows that the cross looms ever before his followers. The cost of discipleship is what we give up to acquire, accomplish, maintain or produce something. It involves a measure of sacrifice and perhaps loss or penalty in gaining something. Cost requires effort and resources. When coupled with discipleship and accepting and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, we can see the power of Jesus's call in this passage and the commitment it demands of us as hearers and doers of the word. Discipleship, we must remember, is a process. It takes time and it involves both false starts and modest successes. As we grow into our faith, to live into the fullness of our humanity and dare to begin to live the holiness that we As disciples, we learn to face life's challenges and joys with a spirit of love, hope, and peace that leads us to an ever deeper spirituality and life of prophetic witness. Ours is a complex passage that we just read. 
that requires us as hearers both to count the cost of discipleship to ensure that we can afford to follow Jesus and to remember that the cost could include all our family and all our possessions. We find here a preliminary qualification for discipleship. Jesus boldly declares that we should not even begin this journey unless we're willing to go all the way. Remember Jesus' words. He says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Now, how's that for family values? There is an impressive list of people here to us by virtue of their kinship that we are commanded to hate. Why did Jesus, the Christ, the personification and embodiment of love, here call for his disciples to hate their nearest kin? or even their own lives. Yes, this is difficult to read. Does it ask? No, it demands that we push away those whom we are most inclined to embrace. In our nation, the United States, which celebrates family values and elevates this commonplace virtue to a principal position, superior even to patriotism. This is an uncomfortable word. In light of Jesus' previous instructions in Luke, though, this word should not strike us as a bolt from the blue. After all, it resonates with Jesus' instructions in Luke chapter 12, verses 51 through 53 where he exclaims, do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. The divisions he then describes are the one's most significant institution in the lives of his audience, the household. He speaks of a household divided between father and son, daughter and mother, mother mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. The instructional bond that forms the basis of our communal lives and our social order will be rent asunder by the radical faith that Jesus proclaimed. This is not a faith comfortable with familial patterns of family values for it requires a commitment from it, but adherence from us that surpasses even that which we have for those most dear to us. Similar themes are fa- found earlier in Luke's gospel. In 1412, he admonishes his host a leader of the Pharisees, not to invite his brothers or relatives to banquets. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. You see, according to Luke's gospel, family is reconfigured by this new faith, our faith. Both this instruction and that in our scripture presumes the one found in Luke chapter 8, verses 19 through 21. You remember when Jesus was sought by his mother and his siblings, Jesus redefines family, not as those with whom we share bloodlines, but as those who hear the word of God and do it. Discipleship moves us beyond comfortable kinship ties to forge new relationships among those commonly committed to Christ. 
These become our new family. Another instructive message on family is found in chapter 18. In the aftermath of Jesus' visit with a certain ruler who seeks knowledge about eternal life, Jesus tells those that give up wife and brothers and parents and children for the sake of the kingdom of God, that they will receive very much more in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. There is much at stake in this reconfiguration, but faithful disciples are assured that our sacrifice will be rewarded by more of what we lost and so also with eternal life. The second thing we learn from this passage is Jesus demands that a disciple carry the cross and follow him. This instruction is reminiscent of Luke chapter 9, verse 23, where Jesus instructs would-be followers to deny themselves and take up their cross daily and even set this in the context of losing their lives for his. What a harsh word this is for us as members of the contemporary Christian community. For we know where Jesus' way leads. This is a word of obligation to a church obsessed with grace. Worse, it is obligation for the consequences for those who refuse the cross. They are deemed unworthy of discipleship. The message is clear. Discipleship costs, in fact, costs us everything. Third, Jesus says, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Wow, this is a hard one indeed, as I am in the process of planning for retirement and hoping that I will be blessed with long life and have the resources to maintain a, a decent standard of living. But in the process of becoming living disciples, we must, as Jesus states, also learn to give up all of our possessions, our need to acquire, our yearning for success, our petty jealousies, our denigrating stereotypes of others, our prejudices and hatreds, and more, and follow the way of Jesus. As we place ourselves on an ever-treading potter's wheel to examine our thoughts, our words, and our actions. These possessions keep us further and further away from the Christ-like walk to which Jesus invites in discipleship. Jesus also challenges our need to be workaholics. Overwork can become an addiction that keeps us from nurturing our relationships, families, friends, and God. Overwork itself becomes a possession that we can pour through rationalizations, such as, I, I promise that after I'm done with this project, I'll not take on so much anymore. Our passage invites us to step back and engage in that deep process of reflection that discipleship has of us to explore whether we are being followers and doers of the word or if we are measuring our lives by human yardsticks. So I, do I have to give it all up or do I have to give it all away? What I understand from this 
to me is that as a disciple, everything I have belongs to God and is to be made available for God's use in the world. Our families, our jobs, our resources, our skills, our energy to be at God's Jesus wants to give us freedom from selfishness, commitment to love, honest faith of suffering, and the faithful stewardship of creation. At the heart of discipleship is transformation. The cost of discipleship it's not just becoming accumulators of new information about life and give, living it fully or changing our behavior in regard to Jesus' teaching. The cost is engaging in a profoundly radical shift toward the ethics of Jesus with every fiber of our being. There's no driftwood in discipleship. As you and I are called to live lives of complete devotion to God, Jesus reminds us in today's passage that following him means that we cannot be shallow or uncommitted believers. The adjectives just simply do not fit the now. As part of this transformation, the cost of discipleship means entering into an intimate relationship with God and obedience to Christ. This intimate relationship invites us to mature in our faith. You and I are challenged by this. It's uncomfortable, but it will lead us to salvation and a deeper relationship with God. My brothers and sisters, believe the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ. By confessing faith in Christ and being baptized into his church, we are given new life life in the spirit. We invite you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for giving your only begotten son as a way to faith and salvation, a way to eternal life, a way to life as your child, a way to your unending love and mercy. Lord, we thank you for the power of your good news. We thank you for your holy scriptures, and how it leads us, towards us into the people of faith that you call us to be. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that he mission and ministry. We thank you that we use those gifts we have been given at our baptism. They all work together for your glory and honor. Lord, we ask you to trust you more and more. We ask you to teach us how to depend on you. For we know in that trust and dependence, we live in the fullness of life. Lord, teach us to show love and concern for others in the things that we say. Lord, we ask for your protection for your guidance, for your forgiveness. Lord, replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sicknesses and ailments with the healing that comes only from you. 
replace our anxiety and our fears and our sadness with your joy, peace, and your hope. Lord, we pray this prayer in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.